الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا من نبي بعده. We start today with ayah number nine of Surah Al-Kahf, and from this ayah onwards, for the next few days, we're going to be talking about the story of the young men who entered the cave. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, in verse nine and ten and eleven, He summarizes the story, and then for the next page and a half, He goes into detail. So it is as if there is a muqaddimah, an introduction, where he summarizes it in a nutshell. And then there is a detailed analysis of every single incident that happened. So today we're going to talk about the summary of the story, and then inshallah, from tomorrow onwards we'll go into the detail. It is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the question that the Quraysh posed in two lines. And then he told them so much more information that they did not ask for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the story by the question, أَمْ حَسِبَتَ أَنَّ أَصْحَابَ did you assume, did you think that the people of the cave and the people of the Raqim, we'll translate Raqim in a while, are of the most amazing of our signs? Meaning, O Quraysh, you are challenging the Prophet by asking him, tell us of the people of the cave. And do you think that the people of the cave and their story is the most amazing thing that we have done? Rather, this is a very trivial matter. And there are so many bigger signs. And you want to question us about something that in the grand scale of things was something so utterly trivial, but you are amazed at it. You, are, you think it is a big miracle, but it is in fact a very trivial miracle. So did you think that the story of the people of the cave was of the most wondrous of our affairs? So Allah is saying, this is what you're trying to test the Prophet ﷺ with, whereas the truths, the signs of his truth are many more than this. His conduct, his character, the Qur'an, all of this is a bigger miracle than the people of the cave and their story. But you're ignoring all of these big miracles and you're quizzing him on something so trivial to see if he is a true prophet. And Allah mentions Ashab al-Kahfi wa raqim the people of the cave and the Raqim. And scholars have differed, what is the Raqim? Some have said it is the mountain that the cave was in. Others have said that Raqim was a inscribed tablet that was put on the cave's entrance. So after the people discover the sleepers, they inscribe something. So they're called the people of the cave and the inscription. In either case, the reference is to the same people and that is the people of the cave. So Allah begins the story by saying, this isn't the biggest sign of the truthfulness of the Prophet ﷺ. But you're asking about it? Okay, I will tell you what you want to know. And Allah says, إِذْ أَوَلْ فِتْيَةُ إِلَى الْكَهَفْ that remember or uh, recall when the young men sought refuge in the cave. Now the story begins and before we begin the story, a quick summary that we mentioned in Surah Yusuf many uh, uh, two, three years ago of the wisdoms of the purpose of Allah telling stories in the Quran. The stories of the Quran is a constant theme. Some of the scholars have said one third of the Quran is stories and this is not far from an exaggeration. One third of the Quran is stories and one third is theology and one third is law and this is not too far from the truth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses stories as a constant theme of the Quran. Why? Because every human being loves to hear a story. From child to adult, male, female, whatever your background, you all want to listen to a story, it's ingrained in us. So Allah uses stories. And Allah's stories are not like the stories of men. Allah's stories are truthful. وَمَنْ أَسْتَقُ مِنَ اللَّهِ حَدِيثًا Every single story in the Qur'an is a real story. There are no fables and legends. Allah's stories, Allah says in the Qur'an, are أَحْسَنَ الْقَصَصِ They are the best of all stories. And Allah's stories, in their stories, there are wisdoms and lessons. So every story in the Quran is a story of lessons, of morals, of wisdom. And one very interesting thing about the stories of the Quran, if you listen and compare the stories of the Quran with the stories of the other books that are claimed to be revealed by God, one of the biggest differences that even the lay person sees, if you read any other book that says, pretends to be from God, you find the stories are so dry and so much full of detail. The son of so-and-so and the son of so-and-so, they came from this place, they did this. So many details that are superfluous, you don't need them. The stories of the Quran usually no name, no names, no places, no dates. 
It's simply the crux of the story. It's simply the overall tale. What do you need to benefit from the story? There are no names and what they were wearing and where they came from. All of this is missing. But if you look at other scriptures, you read genealogies that are half a page long. Sam, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, came from this place and did this. And you get lost in what is the story. All of the details, they make you forget the content of the story. Look at the Quran, hardly any names. Hardly any names. Look at the Quran. Hardly any details that you don't need to know. Also, one of the amazing things about Quranic stories, that so much information is implied. When you read the story, you piece together so many details. Even in this story we will see, Allah does not mention there was a king who was trying to kill them. But we understand it. There's no ayah that says there was a king that was persecuting them. But we understand they're seeking refuge in a cave. They said we believe in Allah. We're not going to worship false gods. We understand. What is the understanding of it? There was a king who was a pagan. He wanted to persecute the Muslims. They're fleeing away from him. No need to mention the details. This is the beauty of the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala conveys so much information in so few verses. And by the way, who are these people of the cave? Scholars have differed so much and some have said this is a group in this area, some have said it's a group in that area, and without being uh, uh, facetious or joking, it is true to say that every culture in the world, every Islamic culture swears by Allah that in their culture there is the cave of the seven sleepers, right? So you have people from Tunisia, from Algeria, from Morocco, from uh, Andalus, from, uh, from Syria, from Jordan, every community, and I do not find it surprising if even India, Pakistan, Somebody's gonna say, there's the seven sleepers in my community. And in the end, Allahu A'lam. Allah knows where they were. Allah knows who they were. We do not know for sure who the seven sleepers were. We don't know which area of the land that they were. Some have said they were early Christians. And this makes sense. However, this problematic in one sense only. And that is, if they were early Christians, then the Yehud of Yathrib would not be asking about early Christians. So others have said these were Yahud living in the Iranian province because in Iran the king uh, was a Zoroastrian and at times he persecuted, at times he was nice. So it is possible they were a group of Yahud. It is possible they were a group of Nasara. Whoever they were, they were believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in the true prophet. And their society was a pagan society. Their society was an idolatrous society. So what happened? In the short version, which is the first two, three ayah, Allah says, If awal fitya tu ila al-kahf. The group of young men, fitya means they were young men, in the prime of their youth, fatayan. So they're 20, 23, 27, this age, young men. It's our fitya to ila al-kahf. These young men, they sought refuge in the kahf. Faqalu, and they said, رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Our Lord is the Lord of the heavens and earth. Uh, and رَبُّنَا رَبُّ فَقَارُ رَبُّنَا Excuse me. فَقَارُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فَقَارُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْلِنَا رَجَدَا I skipped over three verses. Excuse me. So they said فَقَارُ رَبَّنَا So they made a dua. As soon as they entered the cave. فَقَارُ رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِنْ لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً They said, Oh our Lord, give us mercy directly from you. آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا and make our affairs firm and straight. What does this show? It shows us that they were fleeing from a problem. They're seeking refuge in a cave. And they turn to the cave. And the first thing that they do when they enter the cave, they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So notice here there's a combination of two factors. When you're in a trouble situation, you have to do two things. Number one, something of this world. Number two, something of the akhir. Number one, dini. Number two, dunyawi. Something spiritual, something physical. You're sick, you go to the doctor, you make dua. You're jobless, you send your resume, you make dua. You don't have an education, you go to college, you make dua. You need both factors together. They go to the cave and they make dua. They don't sit in their houses and they say, we believe in Allah, tawakkal ala Allah, Allah will pluck us from the heavens and save us from the enemy. No, they flee for their lives. They're running from their community. They find a cave and then they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them. Our religion is a religion of action. It's a religion of activity. You're in a trouble situation, you're gonna have to do something to figure out how to get out of that situation. But when you do something, don't neglect Allah.
Don't forget about that because that's the most important weapon. And that is dua is the weapon of the believer. So Allah says, these young men, they said, we are our Lord, uh, give us mercy directly from you. Make our affairs proper. Our affairs are broken. Make them in good order. So what did Allah do? فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ فِي الْكَافِ سِنِينَ عَدَدًا So we cause them فَضَرَبْنَا عَلَىٰ آذَانِهِمْ is an expression of Arabic. If you translate it literally, it means we struck their ears. We put something on their ears. But the meaning here, they fell into such a deep sleep that no matter how loud the sound, they would not wake up. Because what is the difference between light sleep and heavy sleep? Light sleep, if something happens, you wake up. And Allah is saying, we covered their ears. We covered up their ears so that they couldn't hear anything. Meaning it's an expression. They slept a deep sleep. How long? Sinina adada. Many, many years. And, and this is a double emphasis. Sinina is plural and adada emphasizes. Many, many years. Sinina adada. Then we brought them back up. Meaning, we, and Allah uses the word ba'athna, which is usually used to resurrecting the dead. Indicating their sleep was just almost death. They were so long asleep, they might as well have been dead. And of course, we know that our Prophet wasallam said that, النَّوْمُ أَخُوْ الْمَوْتِ Simple hadith. النَّوْمُ أَخُوْ الْمَوْتِ Sleeping is the brother of dying. Literally, this is a hadith. Going to sleep is the half-brother, is the brother of dying. Why? Because there's a similarity. When we go to sleep, our ruh leaves our body. When we die, our ruh leaves our body. The only difference when we go to sleep, the ruh is connected with some type of strand. When we go to sleep, the ruh is connected. When we die, that connection is cut off. That's the only difference. Otherwise, sleep and death are really the same thing, and that is the ruh exiting the body. And that is why most of humanity, they die in their sleep. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes the souls for sleep, then He never returns them. This is the general rule. Most people, they die in their sleep. Allah is the one who takes the souls of the people when they die, and those who don't die during their sleep. Meaning the bulk of people, they die during their sleep. So even the word that Allah uses, we brought them back. Even though they're sleeping, they're not dead. ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاهُمْ It's as if they were sleeping. Why? لِنَعْلَمَ أَيُّ الْحِزْبَيْنِ أَحْصَادِ مَا لَبِثُوا أَمَدًا In order to test which of the two parties is more accurate for how long they remained in the cave. Now this is a reference to the fact that the Yahud had differed. How many years were the people of the cave sleeping? And Allah references later on in the Quran, and Allah is saying, you're testing me about their knowledge, you yourselves don't even know the full details. You're questioning me and trying to quiz the Prophet Muhammad Are you a true Prophet? And yet you yourselves don't even know the historical reality. We brought them back and then we will see who has the more accurate information. And Allah mentions in the Quran, some said 300, some said this, some said that. They don't even know the details. And in their ignorance and arrogance, they're challenging the Prophet for details and Allah knows all the details. So what does Allah, Allah say in the next verse? That, نَحْنُ نَقُصُّ عَلَيْكَ نَبَأَهُمْ بِالْحَقِّ We are the ones who can tell you their real story with truth. You don't know anything. You don't know the number of people they were, as Allah will mention. You don't know how many years they were asleep, as Allah will mention. Here you come quizzing the Prophet and we will tell you this, and we will tell you even more. We will tell you the real details and story. They were a group of young men. And by saying they were fitya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praying that they were young men who broke away from their culture, who broke away from their society. And this is something that is very true, that generally speaking, the young of society, it is the young minds that are willing to break away from the trends. They're willing to uh, stand up against their culture. They're willing to speak the truth. Once you become older, you become entrenched in the ways of the culture. Once you become older, it's very difficult to break away from the trends of society. And that is why the people of Medina were younger, they accepted Islam. The people of Mecca were the elders, they rejected Islam. When you're young, you're more open-minded, and that is why to this day, look at those who fight 
uh, social justice and the causes and speak out against the government is generally the college crowd, isn't it? Right? It's generally the college level students. And this is around the globe. Look around you. It's the college level who are so roused up. They want to change. They want to do this. They want to do that. And this is, it could be positive. It could be negative. Sometimes the same age group, it can go to the bad side as well. And Allah mentions this in the Quran with the story of Thamud. Right? With the story of Thamud, that وَكَانَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ تِسْعَةُ رَهْطٍ يُفْسِدُنَ فِي الْعَضِ وَلَا يُسْلِحُونَ There were nine, basically young men, mischievous men, causing fasad. And they went and they, uh, and they uh, hamstrung the, the, the camel. So the same youngness, it could be good, it could be bad. When it's used for bad, it can go very bad. But when it's used for good, then subhanallah, the raw iman that we get from our young men and women, it is unparalleled. And that is why our Lord praises young men and women who are religious. The Prophet and praised young men and women who are religious. There is a hadith, وَفِي سَنَدَ ذِي مَقَالِ That uh, uh, the Prophet said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazed at a young man who has no uh, turnings left and right, meaning he's straight, meaning he's mustaqim. Allah is amazed at a young man that he's not going astray. And in the authentic hadith muttafaq alayh, our Prophet ﷺ said, seven are the people, they will be sheltered under the shade of Allah when there is no shade other than his shade. And one of them was, shabun nasha'a fi ibadatillah. A young man or woman, shab means young, which is like teenager and early twenties. Shab nasha'a fi ibadatillah. He is raising himself up in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here Allah is praising, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ They were a group of young men, they believed in their Lord, فَزِدْنَاهُمْ huda. So we increase their guidance. And this is the last verse here, but a very interesting point. Notice, there's a cause and then there's a reaction to the cause. There's a cause and then there's a reaction. They've done something, in return something was done to them. Listen, إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ فَزِدْنَاهُمْ huda. They were a group of young men. They believed in their Lord. And so we gave them increased hidayah. And what does this show? It shows us, if you take one step to Allah, Allah takes ten steps to you. If you go walking to Allah, Allah comes running to you. Every single step you take to Allah, the next step will be easier because Allah has come closer to you. And this is what our Prophet ﷺ said, that whoever goes walking to Allah, Allah comes running to him. Whoever walks one step to Allah, Allah comes ten steps close to him. This is a hadith. And what does this ayah say? They believed in Allah, so we zidnahum, we gave them ziyada in their guidance. And of course this also shows us a very basic fundamental pillar which we all understand and believe, that iman goes up and Allah causes it to go up. That if we turn to Allah, Allah will increase our iman. Imam al-Bukhari rahmahullah ta'ala used this ayah to prove there was a theological controversy in his time, does iman go up or down? And Imam al-Bukhari used this very verse in his sahih, إِنَّهُمْ fityatun. They were a group who believed in their Lord, so we increased their hidayah even more. Which means they had hidayah, and then their hidayah went up. And this also shows us, and with this we conclude, how do you increase your iman and hidayah? You increase it by turning to Allah. Every good deed that you do, your iman will go up. Every good deed that you do, Allah will bless you with more iman. So, the more iman you have, the easier it is to gain yet more Iman. The more Iman you have, the easier it is to gain more Iman. And as I said, every step you take in the religion, the next step will be easier. Every step you take for Allah, the next step will be easier. And wallahi, what good news is this? Because when it comes to the religion, it's like a downward slope for us. That once we start, it becomes easier, 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 and then it becomes a complete habit. And this is of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It doesn't get more difficult. When you go to Allah, the path becomes easier and easier. إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ وَزِدْنَاهُمْ هُدَىٰ And we'll continue the story tomorrow, inshaAllah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.